Okay, this next project is going to be to interface a three and a half inch floppy disk drive to the RC2014 computer. Um, you know, back in the 80s, a lot of computers had floppy disk drives. I entered at the era when uh, five and a quarter was popular, and then of course eventually they transitioned to three and a half. As common as these things were, I actually found that I didn't actually own one when I went to start this project. I kind of assumed there was one in the parts drawer or one I could gut out of an existing computer, but I didn't even have a computer with one. So I bought this off of uh, Amazon for about 12 bucks. It did come with a cover over the top, which I have taken off so we can see inside of it. Um, it does appear to be a used but refurbished drive, and it does work fine. Um, look at the front of it, familiar floppy disk drive. It takes three and a half inch disk, put the disk in, and it opens a little door and clamps down the read-write heads on it. Put the disc back out. Um, I assume, you know, if you're watching this video, you've probably used one of these in the past. So, you know, some parts about this thing. Um, there's, there's a motor back here that moves the head back and forth. That's on this worm gear assembly. Uh, there's, it's a double-sided drive, so there's two heads. There's one here on the top, one on the bottom. Uh, while it's running, this head will move back and forth. There's, of course, somewhere in the bottom of it, you can kind of see it, but not really. There's a really flat cylindrical motor down here that will spin the, uh, the disc itself. Um, I haven't taken the bottom cover off. There's driver electronics of some sort down there. Um, there is uh, some kind of mechanism in it for detecting uh, the start of the track and for detecting track zero. Um, in a five and a quarter, I think that would be, you know, an optical sensor that would look through an index hole in the disc, but I don't know that three and a half inch drives have that. It's possible they're able to determine that, uh, magnetically, be my guess. Um, so anyway, you know, when I started this project, I didn't know a whole lot about how to interface these things, but I sort of figured it out. So here, here is the, uh, floppy drive connector. Um, it's a 34 pin uh, connector, takes a ribbon cable, usually there'll be a split and a twist on one end of the ribbon cable. Uh, you can have ribbon cables with uh, three connectors on it for uh, two drives or two connectors on it for one drive. Uh, so there's 34 pins, half of the pins are grounds. So um, yeah, so down here is pin one. Um, you know, the, the odds are all on this side, the evens are all on that side, so you know, one, three, five, seven, etc. Those are all grounds on half of it. So we only have to worry about uh, 17 pins that are actually used. And those pins on this handy uh, pinout thing I found on uh, Google at pinouts.ru, this diagram tells what all the pins do. So there's a density select, you'd use that to select between high and low density. Um, two pins that are not connected. Then we've got an index indicator. This will pulse when we are at the start of a track. Uh, motor enable for the first drive. You set that low and the, uh, the motor will turn on. Set it high, the motor will turn off. A uh, couple of drive select pins. So if, since the cable uh, allows you to have two drives, we have two different drive selects to tell you know which drive we want to talk to. And then a motor enable for the second drive. And the rest of these pins, um, they're going to depend on uh, which one of these drive selects is set. So that will send these pins to the appropriate drive. Uh, so there's a direction that will tell it to step, you know, either uh, toward the center of the disc or away from the center of the disc. There's a step. We'll pulse that every time we want the head to move one step. And then there's these two pins do writes. So there is a write enable. You set that low and it, it activates the head so the data will be written. And then there's a write data pin which uh, you would stream your data bits out to so they would get uh, written to the disk. Um, down here is a track uh, zero signal. This lets us know we're, when we're on the first track on the disk. Uh, there's write protect which lets us know if our disk is write protected. So our disks, you know, our three and a half disks, they typically have this little flippy thing here. You could flip one way or the other to uh, right protect it. And that's probably a check via an optical sensor or something like that. 
Then the next pin is a read data pin. You know, that's going to read the data off the, uh, the floppy, send it to the controller for decoding. We've got a head select, since there's two heads, you know, you can either have the head that's on the top of the disk or the head that's on the bottom. And then we've got this disk change uh, slash ready pin, uh, which the drive can assert to let you know that uh, someone is uh, changing the disk and the drive is not ready for use. Okay, so I spent some time uh, scouring the internet for designs for uh, floppy controller boards for uh, Z80 based computers, and what I came across uh, was the N8VEM project. And the first board I came across there was the Disk IO version 3 uh, board. So that's what I based uh, my first prototype of this uh, RC2014 uh, floppy controller off of was the, uh, the Disk IO version 3 for the N8VEM. Uh, the schematic is kind of complicated, so I'm going to do it in two pages. Um, one page is there, the other page will be over here. Um, so let's start with the left hand side, which is going to be all of the microprocessor uh, interfacing section. So the most important thing is our floppy controller chip, which is the FDC9266. So that's going to handle talking to the floppy drive. It's going to decode the MFM encoded data from the, from the read write head. Um, it's going to handle uh, seeking to the right track, uh, knowing when we're at the start of the disk, uh, knowing when we're uh, at the start of the track, all that stuff will be coordinated by that chip. And that is this chip here. Over here, as usual, is our RC2014 backplane. So let's look at how we interface this chip to the RC2014. And then on the other half of the schematic, we'll look at how we interface the controller chip to the floppy drive. So we have, uh, you know, it's an 8-bit controller. So like usual, we have uh, eight data lines from the uh, RC2014 to the controller. Um, we have some chip select logic. Uh, it shouldn't be surprising, uh, given my other boards, that we're majority of that's going to be based on a 74HDT138N with a big jumper block that lets you put uh, the floppy controller to any of eight addresses that are 20 hex apart, so 0, 20, 40, 60, 80, A0, uh, C0, or E0. Um, there's a little bit of extra decoding down here, and that's using a 2 to 4 decoder, because we actually need to put two different chips um, at that address. We need the floppy controller, and then we're going to need an output latch to drive some signals to the floppy drive. So we'll use that to decode a couple of extra address pins, so we can put this um, on an address that is 10 hex um, ahead of what address is selected here. So if you put this to uh, 40 hex, this would the floppy will be at 50, and then we will hook our output latch um, 18 hex away. So if you jumper this to 40 hex, that'll be at uh, 58 hex. So yeah, so we've got the chip select, we've got a read pin, a write pin, going to the usual places on the RC2014. We've got some stuff that has to do with DMA. We're not going to use DMA, so we just pull a line um, high. Uh, there's, there's a couple control pins here. There's a uh, terminal count. Uh, terminal count is used uh, when you're doing a data transfer. I believe it's used to stop the transfer. So we're going to have to drive that. And then there's also a reset pin, which we can use to reset the controller. So we're going to have to drive that. Um, obviously, there's no way to uh, drive these additional control lines from our uh, RC2014. So it's one of the things the output latch is going to be used for. Um, it's going to hook to the data bus, and it's going to latch eight different output pins. One of them will be terminal count. One of them goes through a hex inverter and will be the reset signal. Um, we also need a clock. Um, this thing needs an 8 megahertz clock. So on the other uh, half of the schematic we actually have up here an oscillator uh, that will produce an 8 megahertz clock signal. Uh, then there's a test pin which just gets pulled up to 5 volt. So there's uh, in addition to what we've seen here on this half of the, uh, the FTC uh, 9266, there's also three pins that control pre-compensation. Um, those are three bits. They actually go in over here on this side of the uh, controller chip. Uh, we're going to drive those from our output latch. Um, that leaves uh, three pins remaining. Um, two of those we're going to pull over to the uh, floppy connector to use it to control the motor, so we can turn the motors 
for drive A and drive B on and off. And then this one is going to go to the density uh, select pin on the floppy so we can tell the floppy whether we want it to run in high or low density. Uh, this is one of the places where I diverged from the, uh, the disk IO V3. Um, it only had one motor signal and then it used uh, this second pin here to control the, uh, the data rate on the uh, controller. So I probably shouldn't have made that change. Um, that was kind of me thinking I, I needed to be able to control those motors separately when I didn't. And by making this change, I actually put, set myself up in a position where I lack the ability to use uh, 720K floppies. I can only use 1.44 megabyte uh, floppies. So probably in the next reversion, I'll just do it the way their schematic had it. So that covers all of the microprocessor interfacing side of this controller. So that leaves us with uh, the floppy interface section of this. So here's our FDC 9266 chip. You know, the page sliced it right through the middle, so you saw the other half in the previous page. This half, we've got this page. Uh, here's our floppy connector. Um, as you recall, on the floppy connector, there is uh, the entire one half of the connector's ground, so half of the pins go straight to ground. The other pins are those 17 control lines that we're going to need to actually do something with, uh, with most of them. So there's, there's two annoying things about this particular controller chip. Uh, the first is that our floppy um, most of the time deals with active low signals, whereas the controller chip most of the time deals with active high signals. So that leads to a whole bunch of inverters right there through the middle of the uh, schematic here. So we have to, if, if we've got an output signal in here, like the, uh, um, where is it, the right uh, data, um, then we need to take that right data, comes out there, goes through this uh, inverter, and goes to the in right data on the floppy. So, you know, because of the way this chip was designed, it's caused us to have to add two chips worth of uh, inverters to, to do most of the work here. Um, the other thing that's, that's kind of annoying about this chip is that four of these pins here are multiplex. They actually have two different purposes. So like this uh, pin 34, it either reads the right protect line or it reads the two side uh, selection. Um, the next one is either the fault signal or the track zero signal. And which line it reads depends on this first line, which is the read, write, or seek. So if it's in um, read write mode, then it's going to read the write protect bit. If it's in seek mode, then it's going to read the uh, two side bit. So similarly, um, for the for like the step and direction pins, that's that's a good example. If it's in read write mode. The step and direction pins are actually FR and LCT. If it's in seek mode, then they are step and direction. Um, so we we're going to have to demultiplex um, those four lines. So that depending on the right right signal here, those signals go to the right places. And that falls to this 74HC240 uh, chip here, which is in two banks. Uh, one bank we're going to drive with the uh, read-write uh, seek pin from the uh, controller. The other bank we're going to invert the uh, read-write seek via this inverter and drive it. So depending on that... Um, read write seek line either one half of this 74 HCT 240 is going to be active so it's going to take for example the LCT direction pin and you know if it if this uh, signal here is low then it's going to output it out on direction if the signal was high then the LCT direction pin is going to go out here to LCT this controller chip has caused us to add you know this these two sets of hex inverters and this uh, and this 74 HCT 240 here um, as well. So also we're going to have to add another chip because this thing has it has two uh, drive select bits uh, but they don't it's not like one is a drive A select and one is a drive B select these are actually two um, two bits that have uh, they're, they're binary so they can have four different states and they can this chip can drive four different floppies so we need to take these uh, two drive select bits, put them through a uh, two to four decoder, 
and from that we can get our drive select A and drive select B. That's basically it. Um, there's also right here is a resistor network. We want to pull up any signals that come from the floppy so that they're pulled up. I put some jumpers down here to select some various things. Um, so for example, you can, you can control whether the ready signal says it's always ready or whether it's ready signal is connected to the uh, disk change bit on the controller. Um, there's a fault and a two side um, selector. Um, I put those to jumpers, but you just want to install jumpers on those uh, all the time. But you know, if you wanted to do something different, you could change that. Um, this mini jumper, that's the one that I changed from the uh, Disk IO3 board design. Um, that they had this going to the output latch. I hooked it to a jumper, so depending on the position of this jumper, you can either do a 720K or a 1.4 megabyte floppy. As I said before, it would have probably been better to run that over to that output latch the way they designed it. So no sooner did I finish sending off uh, the design for the floppy controller I just showed you and ordering the boards from Osh Park, then I discovered a simpler design on the internet. And this one is based on the uh, Zeta 2 single board computer by Sergey Malinov. And instead of the FDC 9266, it uses a Western Digital WD37C65 floppy controller. So although they basically work the same, there's a lot of differences in how this chip and the other chip interface to the floppy drive. Um, rather than having um, all of those inverters that were necessary because the uh, FDC 9266 output active high signals, whereas the floppy was active low signals, um, the Western Digital chip outputs active low signals, so we could just route them directly to the floppy controller. So that instantly eliminated two chips worth of uh, inverters. So the disk selects, you remember on the, uh, the previous controller I showed you, they had to go to a 2 to 4 decoder. Um, here they can go directly to the uh, floppy connector. So that eliminated the need for that 2 to 4 decoder. So the FDC 9266 had several of the pins multiplexed and you had to kind of use that 74 HCT 240 to, to flip between them. Uh, this one doesn't multiplex them, so you're able to take, um, there's a direction pin, take it straight out to the floppy, um, a step pin, uh, the right gate, etc. No multiplexing needed, so we were able to eliminate another chip. Um, this one, um, we're going to use it with a 16 megahertz clock instead of an 8 megahertz. The, uh, you recall on the previous controller I showed you, we had to have this uh, output register that held things like the motor on off and the pre-compensation and the bit rate select and stuff like that. Um, you don't need that because this one implements the output latch and the configuration register internally. So it has two additional chip selects for that. There's a um, DOR chip select and a CCR chip select. So we will use two stages of address decoding, uh, a 74HCT138 to select the major address of the board, and then a second 74HCT138 to uh, break that major address out into those three chip selects. So one chip select for the controller, uh, one chip select for the uh, output latch on the controller, and one chip select for the configuration latch on the controller. We still do need some pull-ups. Uh, for the inputs from the floppy, so we've got those. And then I've used, um, so the, the way the Zeta 2 did the disk change, it broke the disk change out uh, via the 74HDT125. It took the disk change and routed it to one of the data pins and had a select bit on the, uh, the address decoding to select that, so you could read the disk change bit. Um, from the CPU rather than routing the disk change to the controller, so I preserved that. We've got that 74HCT125 there. Um, now I had three extra gates on the 74HCT125, so I used one of them um, to invert the reset signal so that when you uh, reset the RC2014, it gets inverted and resets the floppy controller. One of them is used over here as some logic so that when you read from the disk output register it will trigger the DMA ACK bit on the uh, on the controller 
Um, I'm not sure exactly how that works because you know I understood how the terminal count bit worked um, very well with the other controller. This one um, on the Zeta 2, they take terminal count, they pull it up to 5 volt, and then they toggle this uh, this DMA ACK bit to uh, to cause a transfer to terminate. So so I've sort of reproduced a similar logic here so that when you read this uh, DOR register, it will toggle that uh, DMA ACK bit. Um, haven't actually tried this out yet, so it remains to be seen how well this will work in practice. Um, I also brought this out so you can toggle it just by using one of the other addresses in the address select logic. Um, so as I said, on the Zeta uh, version 2, they had the terminal count pulled up to 5 volt. I broke it out to a jumper so I could, if I want to, I can toggle terminal count uh, again by using some of that select logic. So here we can see I have built the two boards. The bottom one here is the FDC 9266 version and this one is the uh, Western Digital uh, 37C65 version. Um, let's start by looking at the FDC 9266. So here is the my prototype of the floppy controller board. Uh, we can see the one big chip is our FDC uh, 9266. Um, over here we've got our 3 to 8 decoder, our jumper to select which, uh, which address to put the board on. Um, up here is a 34 pin floppy header. Over here we've got our uh, 8 megahertz crystal oscillator. Um, here's a couple of jumpers that, you know, for PC floppy you just always install them. Jumper 3, this one here is the one that selects the bit rate for either a 720k or a 1.4 megabyte floppy. Um, jumper 4 over here, this is the one that selects the behavior of the, uh, the ready uh, pin. Now let's look at the, uh, the Western Digital WD37C65. Um, we can see the board is much simpler than the, uh, than the uh, FDC9266 board was. This one had two, three, four, five, six extra chips on it. This one only has three. Um, so the big chip is the controller chip. Over here are two 3 to 8 decoders with our uh, address selection in the middle there. Over here is the 74HCT125. Here's the 16 megahertz crystal and the socket for the uh, floppy cable. Okay, so it's time for a live demo. The RC2014 is prepped here much like it usually is with the CPU board, uh, the dual RAM ROM board, uh, the SIO2 board, um, bus monitor board, and here, of course, is the floppy board, which we can plug into um, any slot. Make sure we plug it in straight. Then here we've got a floppy drive. Cable goes from the uh, floppy controller board to the floppy drive. I've got a little power supply set up back here to give the floppy drive its 5 volt supply and uh, a splitter cable to provide power to both the floppy drive and the RC2014. So let's plug it in. There we go. There's a uh, floppy drive's motor turned on and made a little clunk noise. There is a disk in there right now. Uh, let's reset the RC2014. Floppy's light went off. Press spacebar. So I've modified uh, modified Grant Searle's monitor to support the floppy. And we now have uh, the X command for CPM, but I added an F for floppy. So if we push F, uh, we can see that it loaded a bunch of tracks for the uh, operating system to load the CPM. Let me scroll back. You can see here where it's loading a bunch of sectors off the first two tracks. These are the sectors for the CPM uh, operating system. Uh, each one is 512 bytes. Um, this is just diagnostic uh, information that I had it print out. So, you know, it loaded sector 0 on track 0 at address D000 into RAM. Um, when I was debugging it, I, it helped me to print out some checksums and stuff to make sure I was getting the right bytes in. Uh, it reads, uh, I believe it reads a total of 24 sectors 
which is a total of uh, 12k and then once it's done that um, CPM is running um, I added this thing here to print out the media type when I was uh, debugging some issues media type 6 means a 1.44 megabyte floppy so if we do a dir uh, we can see I've already loaded some stuff onto here including Zork uh, 2 So as expected, it takes a little while to load Zork. There we go. I don't know if you could hear that, but there was lots of seeking back and forth with the uh, floppy head. Um, inside the barrow, brass lantern is here so I could take the lantern. It's nice and slow, just like an old uh, 80s PC would have been. Take sword. Uh, let's go south. Uh, south. Southwest. Uh, dark tunnel. Let's go in there. Pitch black. Likely to be eaten by a grew. I don't. You know, nothing bad's going to happen, right? Ah, uh, you have died. You're eaten by a grew. So, yeah, that it's it's working as it should be. Um, See, we can use quit, and when we quit, um, it actually uh, warm boots CPM and reloads, uh, I think, the first 12 sectors again. So you can see that little warm boot message, but, you know, it's a fully uh, functional CPM installation. I haven't installed a whole lot on it yet, but I could install uh, more things if I wanted to. Okay, so let's do a live demo of the WD-37C65 uh, floppy controller. So I've already got it... Uh, board built and uh, hooked up to the floppy cable. Just plug it into an available slot in the RC2014 and then we will uh, power up. Uh, reset our board. Let's try that again. Reset our board. Um, so I did have to rebuild the uh, monitor ROM because we're now using a different floppy controller. So I had to change a constant telling it uh, which floppy controller to build in. So I've reburned the monitor ROM. I also uh, made a new floppy disk and I've already installed CPM on it and uh, uh, some CPM files. Plug in the floppy. Go over here. We'll hit our space bar. X, F. And just like with the FDC 9266, it's loading the sectors off the floppy. It's booted CPM. We look here, we can do a dir. So it, it works exactly the same way um, as the other floppy controller. I'm just showing it for completeness to demo them both. Um, we can run some commands. So we can do stat. It tells us how much space is left on our floppy. Stat xmodem.com tells us. Uh, how big xmodem.com is. Um, run mbasic, load Microsoft Basic. Takes a little while, lots of stuff to load. Exit Microsoft Basic. Now you notice when we run a big command and then exit, it has to reload uh, CPM um, from the floppy. That's why we get this little floppy media type. Uh, thing printed out at the end of the command. Um, let's, just like we did before, we can load Zork 2. Takes a while to load Zork. Look, south. Let's take the sword. Take sword. South. Um, yeah, Zork, you know. Um, attack little. He's a wizard. Let's attack wizard. Said I could see the wizard. Oh, I dropped the sword. Well, bummer. Um, anyway, you know, Zork uh, working as it should. So. Uh, just like the other floppy controller, this one works uh, fine. Um, to choose between the two implementations, I like this one better because it has a lower chip count, uh, more functions implemented on the, uh, the floppy controller itself.
And that's it for this demo. Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.